in the land where all men are created equal, a much larger industrial war was servicing out of the inhumane and ungodly festering sore of chattel slavery. From its inception, the United States was founded on the idea of liberty. They fought the British to be free. The decades prior to the war featured an increase in worldwide demand for cotton, readily available slave labor, the cotton gin improving the efficiency of cotton production, and a political and cultural battle between those pro-slavery and anti-slavery. Such economic drivers and political divisions would inevitably portend unforeseeable tragedy. The infamous Dred Scott verdict, a verdict that could potentially have legalized slavery nationwide, polarized the nation and cut across party lines. 1860 would see a divided and fractured Democratic Party help to facilitate the otherwise improbable electoral victory of Republican Abraham Lincoln. The election result, for the first time in history, was beamed across the country by telegraph. The election of this new anti-slavery president precipitated southern states, led by South Carolina, to succeed swiftly, one by one and one after another, in order to preserve their version of liberty. The South feared for the end of their way of life. A Confederate constitution, organized militia, and an administrative structure of a newly self-declared nation, the Confederate States of America, appeared within three months of Lincoln's election. The outbreak of war set about the release of political tensions over slavery. When hostilities began, people in the southern states danced in the street. In their land of liberty, about one in eight Americans, men, women and children, were, in the eyes of their exploiters, little more than beasts of burden. Slaves were bought and sold within sight of the Capitol building in Washington. These people were the personal property of other people. They were enslaved from the moment of their birth, a dirt floor welcome to the world, and, if they survived, were branded and enslaved due solely to the color of their skin. It was both a war of succession and a war for the soul of the still young nation yet to be fully formed in constitution and character. The militias of the southern states were able to quickly unite into the Confederate Army, initially larger than the Union Army, which at that time had been preoccupied with fighting the nation's indigenous peoples. Lincoln believed the purpose of the succession was to change the nature of government. He stated his war aims as nothing more than preserving the Union, and it was Republican Party policy not to interfere with slavery where it already existed. He appealed to the better angels of our nature in his first inaugural address. However, four years later in his second inaugural speech, he stated that he believed God's purpose for the war was to eradicate slavery. Nonetheless, the rank-and-file Union soldier believed he was fighting for the Union and the flag. A common contemporary phrase was, fighting to maintain the best government on earth. Such is the murky, dark and enigmatic nature of war and its causes. The causes of this war, the details of which are still debated by historians. No one envisioned the total war industrial scale slaughter that followed. The government in Washington assembled its armies to reclaim the breakaway states. Confederate General P.T.G. Beauregard ordered the first shot to be fired upon Fort Sumter on a Sunday, beginning the armed conflict. The garrison was planning to surrender. Beauregard would have got the same result on Monday without the bloodshed had he been a bit more patient. Instead, history records that the South fired the first shot. 32 million people to the North were now at war with the other 9 million to the South with about 4 million of them being slaves. The troops came from all over the northern part of the country. They were Irish Americans, Greek Americans, German Americans, and so on. 
Men from Europe and Canada arrived and immediately joined the Union Army. Many were bilingual, speaking both English and their mother tongues. When the English language failed to supply the right word, they used their own. And when the different varieties were mixed together, the troops appropriated words from each other and added the new words to the hybrid soup that is the English language. Skedaddle traces its origin from this time, first recorded in 1861. It is not known where it came from before the war and is not necessarily a creation of the conflict. Nonetheless, due to the war it caught on and spread across the country. It is definitely a very useful turn of phrase when people are shooting at you. A contemporary expression for experiencing battle was seeing the elephant, which caused more than a few men to flee. The conflict and the congregation of men from all walks of life, from all over the world, catapulted skedaddle into global English. When troops began to desert or avoid the draft in large numbers, skedaddle was the word most used. Shoddy also emerged in the same way as skedaddle, as an adjective to refer to the poor quality of the supplies the Union soldiers were provided with. Simon Cameron served as Secretary of War during the early stages of the conflict. He conducted the business of war in a corrupt way, paying high prices to his supporters for inferior goods. Lincoln got rid of him by sending him to Russia as an emissary. Shoddy was originally a noun to refer to low quality wool and the goods made from it. In order to fulfill orders, textile manufacturers wove recycled wool into the shoddy fabric. The result was that the uniforms ripped after a few weeks of wear. Shoddy soon became an adjective to describe the various defective goods supplied by the War Department. Later, a Civil War period was irreverently referred to by contemporaries as the Age of Shoddy, due to the various improvised infrastructure brought about by the immediate needs of the war. There was much to describe as Shoddy. Railway bridges made from either bean poles or corn stalks were typical of the rush to facilitate the war effort. The practice of burning railway bridges was a common military tactic, creating the need for speedy rebuilding. The Union Engineering Corps became uniquely skilled in erecting bridges at a speed that seemed like magic. Shebang was an Irish Gaelic term used for a hut or shed, first recorded in 1862. Irish troops referred to any small structure on the battlefield or camp as a shebang. While we no longer use shebang to refer to such shelters, it survives in the expression, the whole shebang, first recorded in 1869. 1862 saw the composition of The Battle Cry of Freedom, written by George Frederick Root. It was a patriotic song advocating the Union cause. The song was immensely popular, even the Confederate soldiers liked it, so an alternative version was composed for them. The first line of the Union version contains the words, Rally round the flag. The Confederate version calls for rallying around the Bonnie flag. Some of the most famous songs ever written came from this period, such as the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and later, When Johnny Comes Marching Home. A defeated or idle man was called a deadbeat, and a near miss was known as a close call. When a Confederate soldier was shot, he would most likely be shot with an Enfield rifle from Britain and with miniball ammunition from France, a devastating combination. The Union Federal Armory learned to make cheaper substitutes for the expensive French miniball ammunition, improving the economy of the carnage. New technologies with old tactics saw casualty rates skyrocket to unprecedented levels. Lincoln was kept up to date by telegraph. The telegraph system, along with the railroads, were taken under control by the War Department through the power of the President. This complex network of wires was known to the Union soldiers as the Grapevine, so named since telegraph wires strung in the trees tangled and twisted so much they resembled grapevines. The telegraph office was located at the War Department. It was here that Lincoln fought much of the war, awaiting important dispatches, 
trying to speed up slow generals and getting to them what they needed. There was a wooded area between the White House and the War Department, with a characteristic indifference to security. Lincoln made frequent late night strolls between the two buildings, where he was a frequent visitor. War Department staff set up a cot for him to sleep on while waiting for important correspondence. Lincoln read not only telegrams sent to him, but any and all telegrams stored at the War Department. Moreover, he not only read Union military telegrams, but also those of the Confederacy. A telegraph cable could easily be intercepted at any point by splicing the lines in a process that would eventually become known as wiretapping, first recorded in post-war accounts of the activity in 1878. Both sides wiretapped, and bogus messages could be sent at the point the line was spliced. Each side began to send sensitive messages in code. The Confederacy could not decode Lincoln's messages, eventually publishing the coded messages in Southern newspapers appealing to the readers for help. When the North did send one particular message in the clear, hungry Confederate soldiers were able to use that data to intercept a shipment of Union beef and make a barbecue of it. Humorous messages between the Yankee and Dixie sides would occasionally go back and forth. While the telegraph had a big impact on the Union's ability to organize its own forces and was a major contributor to eventual Union victory, clandestine wiretapping on its own is not thought to have had any significant impact on the outcome of the war. Most messages were short and trivial and of little use to the enemy. The North made better use of the telegraph and the railways, giving them an important edge. Southerners often pushed back against industrialization and centralized strategic direction of the war effort, contributing to their ultimate defeat. When Grant took overall command of the Union Army, he chose to command from the field. Such a feat could not have been done without effective use of the telegraph. After the first Battle of Bull Run, the Congress adopted a resolution limiting the war to the maintenance and supremacy of the Constitution and not to interfere with established institutions in the South. This was done to unite the North and bring on board those who weren't abolitionists. Lincoln had not always been an abolitionist, but over the course of the war he had become convinced of the moral necessity of the abolition of slavery. On the 1st of January 1863, Lincoln signed into law the Emancipation Proclamation, also known as Proclamation 95, was a legal instrument authorizing and directing an act within the legal powers of a sitting president. The Union had already begun the practice of confiscating Confederate property, to which was considered legal under the powers of a president conducting a war. Emancipating the slaves came under this jurisdiction. It was uncertain whether the Congress had the constitutional authority to take property from civilians, and the slaves were still considered property under existing laws. Lincoln was advised that he only had the legal power to confiscate private property, whether it was a horse and cart or a human being, under the powers invested under his authority to conduct the war effort. For this reason, the Emancipation Proclamation only applied to the states that the Union was at war with. The legal status of freed slaves was that of contraband of war, as opposed to status as human beings. Slave labor, used mostly for building forts and hauling supplies, was essential to the Confederacy war effort. Slaves were impressed into service before white men were conscripted. The move was not popular. It had little support in the Congress and defied the accepted political logic of the day. The proclamation, a legal device that would now be described as an executive order, was derided at the time as something akin to the Pope's bull against Halley's Comet, alluding to the fact that the laws of Washington were not only not recognized by the Confederacy, but held in utter contempt. The fact that Lincoln could make this happen displayed awesome leadership and genuine moral courage. There were, of course, coexisting practical and strategic reasons for the move. To make clear that the war was a fight against slavery would preclude British intervention on behalf of the Confederacy. There were significant public opposition within Britain to the inhuman practice of enslavement. The British Navy was kept busy intercepting the vessels of slave traders and liberating the imprisoned humanity within. The proclamation did not actually free any slaves. It did, however, motivate more to escape. Moreover, it signaled to the world that the war was a moral crusade 
very much about slavery, and it helped to dissuade any European powers from intervening on behalf of the Confederacy. Well, it wasn't until December 1865, with the adoption of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution that slaves were fully and legally emancipated. Nonetheless, the phrase Emancipation Proclamation is remembered as when the moral victory was won. Lincoln described the measure as the nation's last best hope to win the war. Lincoln was always opposed to slavery, but what he thought this meant in practical terms shifted during the war. At first he believed in a limited emancipation, then he believed in immigration of slaves to uh, Liberia or Haiti, and finally he um, came to advocate for the 13th Amendment. The war raged on, with battle after battle, resulting in appalling and unprecedented casualties never seen before and remained unmatched into the wars of the 20th century. In 1863, Lincoln travelled to a cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, in order to dedicate a new cemetery for Union soldiers. The Gettysburg Address is one of the best known speeches in history. It was a miracle of beauty, clarity and brevity that articulated the principles of real liberty and democracy for generations to come. Having earlier in the year issued the Emancipation Proclamation, the speech articulates representative democracy as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Lincoln may have derived these words from a sermon by Theodore Parker, first recorded in 1850, where he used a similar phrase. These words have hence been used by anyone wishing to define the highest ideals of democratic government. The draft in the North began in 1863 and was in full swing by 1864. A new federal system of conscription was instituted, replacing the existing practice of the states calling up their own militias. Young men from all over the country were being drafted. Those objecting to sending perfectly nice boys to kill and die would use the expression, rob the cradle, when the Confederacy raised the age limit to 45, U.S. Grant commented, they have robbed the cradle and the grave. The shift in meaning to seducing a younger person was first recorded in 1949. Many of the unwilling soldiers hid or were hidden from the army. These places they found or were provided with were known as hideouts. This phrase was not recorded until 1885, but was almost certainly in colloquial use as a hideout referred exclusively to a place a conscript hid from the draft. Both uh, a union or a confederate draftee could purchase a substitute. The practice gave rise to the saying, a rich man's war but a poor man's fight. The phrase originated in the south and soon spread to the north, where it was equally applicable. The substitute system was highly unpopular and rife with abuses. In the south, the price of a substitute reached $1,000. The privations in the South led to large numbers of Confederate soldiers to abscond in order to support their starving families. Both sides abolished the substitute system in 1863. Sideburns sees its word origin in honor of General Burnside with his shaved chin and whisker-like upper facial hair. The term Burnsides was first recorded in the Cincinnati Enquirer in 1875, clearly in honour of the Civil War general. By 1880, Burnsides and Sideburns were being used interchangeably, with the former eventually dying out. Burnside the man was a dapper kind of well-bred fellow, who won his generalship by being amiable and gentlemanlike, qualities many men of the day looked up to. He had only a brief and unremarkable military career, prior to being asked to take on a generalship. While he chanced upon early successes, the well-spoken socialite general proved less than competent at uh, conducting battles. Lincoln transferred the administration and enforcement of internal security matters to the War Department, and under these auspices, Burnside helped Lincoln arrest dissidents and rogue journalists. Many were arrested and detained without a warrant, rather by a simple instruction from the Secretary of State or the Secretary of War. War Department agents infiltrated anti-war groups to detect possible sedition or treason. 
Lincoln justified the detainments and the suppression of habeas corpus by saying, must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts, while I must not touch the hair of the wily agitator who induces him to do so. Those opposing a vigorous prosecution of the war, mostly in reference to anti-war Democrats, were called copperheads. The term was first known to be used by Ohio Republicans in reference to the venom their Democrat opponents were thought to be espousing. By 1863, all anti-war Democrats had the epithet attached to them, many wearing it as a badge of honor in a movement they viewed as opposition to Republican tyranny. An anti-war copperhead pamphlet written by an editor of an anti-war newspaper, The New York World, featured the ugly 1864 coinage, Miscegenation. The pamphlet, entitled Miscegenation, the theory of the blending of the races, referred to interbreeding in order to lead people to believe the policies and war aims of the Lincoln administration would threaten the purity of the white race. Another anonymous pamphlet, pretending to be written by the Lincoln campaign, advocated the benefits of miscegenation. I have no idea how to pronounce that, it's not a word I use. The Wisconsin newspaper published a parody of When Johnny Comes Marching Home. It went something like, uh, The widow maker soon must cave, hurrah, hurrah. We'll paint him in some Negro's grave, hurrah, hurrah. Except they didn't use the word Negro, they used the other N-word. These deplorable efforts of the Copperheads had little effect on the 1864 president, presidential election. Lincoln won 55% of the popular vote. Burnside's military career ended with a fiasco at the Battle of Petersburg. Burnside had trained and oversaw an initiative to tunnel underneath a Confederate fortification. 8,000 pounds of gunpowder was placed at the end of a tunnel to blow a hole at the end to allow a vertical entrance behind the line. The detonation succeeded in creating the entrance. However, when the Union troops entered the tunnel, they could not climb up the hole into the fort. All of the officers on duty that day were drunk and or incompetent. They were the kind of officers who had no business being an officer. No one had thought to supply ladders. That and other disasters led to 4,000 men being slaughtered during that part of the campaign. General Grant was forced to withdraw his army from Petersburg. To his credit, Burnside had long argued that he was not cut out to bear the responsibilities put upon him. Refrain from the political intrigue rife among the Union Army leadership and always took the blame for his various failures, which was an uncommon trait among generals. Nonetheless, the Union was winning the war elsewhere and everywhere else. Defeat for the Confederates was merely a matter of time, and Lincoln was renominated to stand for another term as president. When discussing his renomination in a speech, he commented, I have not permitted myself, gentlemen, to conclude that I am the best man in the country, but I am reminded in this connection to a story of an old Dutch farmer who remarked to a companion once that it was not best to swap horses when crossing streams. The Democrats are responded by adopting as one of their slogans, time to swap horses. No incumbent president had been re-elected since 1832. Nonetheless, with the subsequent capture of Atlanta, victory on the field assured electoral victory for Lincoln. The Republican Party won the election on a platform of peace through victory. The hopeful notion among the Confederates that European powers would intervene in their favour grew increasingly unlikely, and the blockading of the Confederacy was eliminating the Confederacy's ability to wage war. After capturing Atlanta, Sherman marched to the coast to split the Confederacy into two and vowed to make Georgia howl. His march through the Carolinas was even more brutal. War means misery, death, disease and destruction. It also means prisoners. Both sides mistreated theirs. The breakdown of a prisoner of war exchange agreement led to terrible atrocities. Both sides held their prisoners in austere conditions.
By 1864, a Confederate prison in Alabama was overseen by a Swiss-born ex-private, Henry Wurz. He had been injured, losing the use of his right arm, and was a dispatch officer for the Confederacy before assuming command of the prison, Camp Sumter in Andersonville, Georgia. The prison was hastily built in 1864 to relodge prisoners transferred from a prison near Richmond, which was by then being threatened by Union troops. The conditions there were miserable, even by the standards of the day. 45,000 Union prisoners of war were held there, of which an estimated 30,000 died due to the conditions in the prison. The destruction of Confederate records mean that, means that an exact number can never be known. An early attempt to liberate the camp led to 600 of the would-be liberators being taken there as prisoners. To what extent Wurz is to be held responsible for the privations are still debated. But it can be said with certainty that he was a tough disciplinarian. Several prisoners were shot by his revolver. Others were killed by the prison guards on his direct order for infractions of prison rules. There was a light fence erected uh, 5.8 metres in front of the main wall and if a prisoner crossed it, he was shot. This line was known as the deadline. Although there were other fences of this kind in other prisons, deadline was first recorded in Wurz's trial documents a year later. He was hanged, the only Confederate officer to be tried and executed for war crimes. Camp Sumter actually did not have the worst mortality record. This distinction went to a facility in Salisbury, North Carolina, with a 34% mortality rate. The mortality rate for Camp Santa was around 29%. Deadline was first used to refer to a date to which a newspaper article must be submitted in from around 1920, with the usage broadening from there. Confederate armies and cities began to surrender piecemeal to the Union, who destroyed and plundered as they surrounded and penetrated the South, the soon-to-be doomed Confederate States of America. The civilians feared hunger and disease more than the Union troops whose advance was slowed by the trance warfare tactics of the day. As the defensive area became smaller, they became easier to defend, further delaying the inevitable. The uh, Confederacy held out until the final surrender on the 11th of April 1865. Uh, U.S. Grant accepted the surrender of all Confederate forces after the Battle of Appomattox. A surrender document was signed. Grant afforded Lee with rations for his starving army. A grateful Lee commented that the generosity of the surrender terms would help reconcile the country. Grant went on to become the 18th President of the United States. Lee continued to be involved in post-war politics. The death toll estimates ranged from uh, 70, 750,000 to 1 million dead. Before the war, people referred to the United States in the plural, the United States are a union of states. At the end of the war, the US became a singular noun the United States is one nation. The word Union, which had come to represent only the North, was largely replaced by a more singular word, Nation. It was the beginning of what Lincoln called Reconstruction. It was not the end of violence and struggle. Pockets of resistance stubbornly fought on. Southerners who would not cooperate with or accept Reconstruction efforts were dubbed unreconstructed. Violence and death at the hands of who would not accept the end of the old way of life would continue well into the next century. This term is no longer in use, in regular use, but occasionally pops up to refer to people who hold onto an ideology held prior to a current orthodoxy. For example, when our Bob Hawke's Labour Party won the Australian federal election, the ruling ministers embarked on a very different policy direction than that of the previous Labour government during the 70s under Gough Whitlam. Those in the new government who opposed the new policy direction were labelled unreconstructed Whitlamites. An organisation of unreconstructed former Confederate officers and soldiers called themselves the Ku Klux Klan, based on Mangal Greek to mean clan or circle. They were disparate groups who sought to terrorise freed slaves and re-establish a pre-war order. As many were prominent members of the communities engaging in violence and illegal activities, it necessitated the hoods and the secrecy of the membership. Their aim was to keep former slaves in a subordinate position. The original organisation was suppressed by Union soldiers by 1870 under the, under the direct supervision of 
President Grant. Various unrelated groups claiming the name have cropped up since, and the name lives on to articulate an anti-government, white supremacist ideology. The old life they advocated was called the Lost Cause by 1866. Those who came from the North to the South to prosper due to the changes Reconstruction afforded were disparagingly referred to as carpetbaggers. This was a reference to the carpetbag, a kind of a handheld luggage fashioned from old oriental rugs favoured by the Northerners relocating to the South.